Okay, so um, as I was saying, we're from the Gothic department at MMU and we're all working in various areas related to the weird. I'm sure that my colleagues will be able to talk about their particular um, areas of interest. Uh, I've managed to kind of sneak in through the back door as my work's primarily on science fiction um, and how that relates to ego criticism, but I've managed to, you know, attach my heart to that particular. I've muted myself. My project in particular looks at um, the generic hybridity between sci-fi and horror and how those are interacting in sort of contemporary fiction um, cinema and um, literature. So my topic today is specifically about how to deal with the climate crisis as it is. Um, so to set the scene, my aims today are to outline what the conceptual challenge is. Why is the climate crisis such a problematic thing for us to get our heads around? And how can we use the ideas of cosmic horror and the sort of limitations of the human imagining to confront that in many ways? I'm gonna look at some differing responses to this and in particular, the two texts today. And hopefully by the end, we'll be able to offer some tentative optimism, although we'll see how that goes. So um, starting with a little lighthearted doom saying, uh, the future is pretty bleak. Um, newspaper and media outlets are replete with worst case scenarios, dour predictive models, and the news is set to remember resemble, like Al Gore said in 2005 in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, like a nature hike through the book of revelations. A near unanimous number of scientific minds have explicitly linked direct or indirect human action, particularly that of fossilized, uh, sorry, industrialized fossil fuel um, no nations to an ongoing parade of extreme weather events ecological devastation and the irrevocable alteration to biodiversity and ecosystems, the complexity of which incites a cascade of feedback loops that we will not be able to predict or comprehend in their entirety. Our adaptation and response to these ongoing challenges is going to be enacted in real time through the cultural engines of film and TV and literature. And thus the cultural landscape is embroiled in what has been claimed in the book, The Great Derangement by Amitav Ghosh as a crisis of culture where realism will fail to capture and is failing to capture the extremity and unpredictability of the future, leaving the genres of the fantastic, such as the Gothic, science fiction, horror and fantasy to express our ecological anxieties. Fiction which expresses and reflects the fears of a non-human natural world has very often tended towards a quite specific model, particularly in earlier works, such as the 1950s and the 1960s. What we can see here in these array of films is what might be called the nature strikes back model, where nature, usually animals or some sort of irradiated monster created from the earth itself, uh, granted agency through the wavy term of radiation, um, seeks vengeance, encroaching on traditionally human spaces and causing havoc while doing so. And while it's true that fillers, uh, figures such as King Kong and Godzilla have never quite vacated the box office, uh, I'm pretty sure there was a King Kong movie last year, there'll probably be another one next year, um, the contemporary cinema that's addressing our climate responses and crisis responses is either in a literal or metaphorical sense is doing so in these two dominant trends I'd like to point out. The first one is what we might call the apocalypse averted scenario. So in this earth is threatened by some cataclysm. The disaster is usually man-made or encouraged by the actions of um, particular individuals, usually the evil corporations, um, incited by a combination of greed, foolishness, or scientific hubris. The hero, usually American, although sometimes Jared Butler does his best uh, American accent, uh, sometimes <laughs> prevents this. The hero is always morally good, 
um, on the side of righteousness and right action. There's little argument about nuance or delineation between sides. In an apocalypse averted scenario, disaster can be avoided through individual action by those with powers or abilities beyond that of normal, quote unquote, people. The comfort offered by these films is not only do people, not us, but other people have a capacity to alter the fate of the world, but also that unite in a bipartisan togetherness to combat a common enemy is a possibility that might arise. The second is a bit more grim. The second is what we might call an apocalypse endured scenario. And in this earth or a recognizable version of Western capitalist society has already ended or is in the process of ending. And this is where quite a lot of disaster films situate themselves and post-apocalyptic films particularly. It's no surprise that the new millennium has seen a rise in depicting embattled family units struggling to survive after the end has come and a replete with didactic metaphors outlining our ecological mismanagement. In an apocalypse endured scenario, the essence of humanity is shown to survive. And while earth as we know it and societies as we would recognize them are destroyed, survival on an individual level is possible. The earth can't be saved. There's nothing we can do, says this scenario, but maybe humanity can be and civilization can be rebuilt from the remnants. My main question in my research and in this presentation is, are there any alternatives to these? One says that we as individuals can't, and so does the other. One says there's no option. The other is more within the realm of fantasy, superheroes coming down and saving the day. Can there be any alternatives? The main problem about climate change is its challenge to cognitive paradigms. And a major stumbling block in the confrontation with climate change, aside from slow moving legislature and the partisan politicization of ecological response, is the conceptual challenge it poses to society on both an individual and behavioral level. This is been called what um, some people have described as eco-paralysis or eco-anxiety. They are slightly different. I'm going to be focusing on eco-paralysis, which refers to the, the inability to take action um, due to the activation of psychological defense mechanisms. The problems seem so big, the scale so great that we either individually or in terms of a community feel we can't do anything. Anxiety and distress comes from trying to confront this drastic paradigm shift, leading to feelings of being overwhelmed, a turn towards apathy, and I'm sure my colleague will speak a bit more about what we do with nihilism um, in the contemporary period. Uh, and in some cases, uh, unfortunately, outright denial that climate change is a thing, which is uh, always ridiculous. Um, this state of challenge can be reflected in the writings of Eugene Thacker, and it's his quote you can see on the screen here his argument that the deep destabilization brought about by climate change, particularly the visual and lived through extremities of weather and temperature, due to its scale of complexity is a challenge that we will need to work through in our fiction. And it's arguably through horror that we might be able to confront this unthinkability. Cosmic horror mirrors a lot of these ideas about limitations of human cognition. This quote from supernatural horror and literature mentions the inability of the human mind to understand everything, the unthinkable that Saka talks about a bit earlier. And if cosmic horror is predicated on humanity's limitation to comprehend the universal realities, a universe that is careless at best and malignant at worst, the question within cosmic horror, if we're using this as a lens through which to consider cultural mechanisms, is how to survive this pulling back of the veil. For Lovecraft, recourse to ignorance is always a good option. You will either go mad by realizing this or you need to run away into what he describes as the peace and safety of a new dark age. And that'll come in to talk a bit later. Um, 
I'm going to be looking at two different texts today about how to respond to the unthinkable, perhaps beyond this, perhaps utilising cosmic horror, um, either losing yourself to the paralysis and the perpetuation of anxiety and doom on the one hand, or else recognising both the reality and magnitude of the situation, but in a more critically positive way, utilising the impact humanity can have to alter things for the better. So I'm going to be considering two texts today. Uh, the first evidenced here on the left is Event Horizon, released in 1997 and directed by Paul W.S. Anderson, who's probably better known for blockbuster video game adaptations such as Resident Evil and Mortal Kombat and this year's Monster Hunter, which was interesting. Um, the second film here on the right is the more recent, but probably not as well known, Sunshine from 2007, directed by Danny Boyle off the back of Train Spotting and 28 Days Later. Both of these films are sci fi horror hybrids in that they utilize the cinematic language of both as texts which deal with encounters of the cosmic unthinkable. They're valuable to consider in conversation with one another because despite incorporating many of the same thematic elements, the concept of guilt, the concept of confronting and encountering the immensity of reality and the interaction between the scientific and the theological that this breeds, they come to very different conclusions about how humanity can fit within the cosmic landscape. Um, or to put it in terms of our topic today, if it is possible for humanity to survive confronting the unthinkable. Um, as a heads up, before we get into the nitty gritty of things, I'll be scattering spoilers left, right and centre. So if you were intending on watching these things unburdened by the foreknowledge of the plot, perhaps briefly put your fingers in your ears when I talk about who dies. Um, and additionally, both of these films tend towards the more graphic end of their BBFC ratings, particularly Event Horizon. Um, was infamous for its graphic content at the time. So there will be some images in the event horizon portion that do lean into more gore and body violence and body horror. So just as a warning for that, if that's anything you're uncomfortable with. So to talk about event horizon, a brief overview of the plot very, very quickly. Um, the film follows a search and rescue vessel called the Lewis and Clark in the midst of responding to a distress signal received from another ship called the Event Horizon, an experimental vessel which disappeared seven years prior on its maiden voyage. The lead scientist of that project, Dr. Weir, played by Sam Neill, reveals that at the time of its disappearance, the Event Horizon was attempting to break the faster than light barrier by creating man-made black holes to travel through. Scientific implausibility aside, this turns out to have been a, a bad idea. Um, the ship has returned, mysteriously, but seemingly possessed by some malevolent sentience um, intent on killing or taking the new crew away um, as it did the old crew. So regarding this, we're going to look at the concept of the unthinkable and how Event Horizon considers boundary limits, um, the limitations of human cognition and um, position within the universe. So it follows quite traditional Lovecraftian horror beats, uh, if, if they can be said to exist. Um, the film outlines conceptual and cognitive limits. Um, the quote here, from early on in the film emphasizes how far away they are from civilization, from help, from the known area, the outer reach, so to speak. This is quite common in space horror films, particularly to emphasize isolation. Here, it's also impacting on outlining limitation. The Lewis and Clark, which is the name of the search and rescue vessel, is another reference to um, the American frontiersman who, after the Louisiana Purchase, um, sought to chart um, the landscape of America. Um, and equally, the event horizon is an astrophysic term which denotes the boundary around a black hole outside of which nothing, even light, can escape. This is to say that Event Horizon very early on sets up that there is boundaries and limitations to what humanity can achieve and what humanity can do. And because of science, we've broken that. And um, the conversation between Weir and the crew is put in terms of 
scientific achievement versus scientific meddling. The crew sees this as breaking universal laws that shouldn't be broken, whereas Weir sees it as just, just working within the boundaries of science. Um, but Weir's science, the invention of a gravity drive, which attempts faster than light travel by opening these black holes, leads them to connect and contact a realm meant to be inaccessible to humans. This realm has an interesting um, vision within the film, and it's arguably to do with um, the quite convoluted production of the film. Um, the first writer of the film called Philip Eisner was quite intent on having Cthulhu-esque monsters being the ultimate villains of the piece. But when it came to a rewrite, the re person who worked on it was the screenwriter of Seven. And that's one of the reasons why the film leans so hard into the unthinkable, but also considering the extremities of human logic through kind of religious allegory. Um, like the various Cthulhu cults who understand the Elder Gods uh, and the cosmic insignificance of man through religious models, the film renders its vision of the unthinkable through the concept of hell. So you can see the pictures here are replete with fire. There's quite a graphic image at the top of uh, a man having taken his own eyes out. And the subtitle below says, liberate me or save me from hell. And the film arguably doesn't conclude whether or not it is hell, but that that is the concept that how people can comprehend it. Um, On the left-hand side, we have Weir, and Weir is an interesting character that I'll talk about a bit later, in that he is subsumed by the ship to become its quasi-disciple and take the crew with him. Um, Hell acts as a conceptual placeholder to stand in for an incomprehensible reality. And indeed, when they go onto the ship, there is the use of flashing interruptive takes of one or two shots, which show flashes of graphic, sadistic and sexual violence that is seemingly unsurvivable and impossible in its extremity, used to emphasize that this goes beyond human capacity to comprehend. There is a repeated symbolism of eyes. The guy at the top is the biggest example, but Weir himself gouges his own eyes out near the end of the film. And um, the hallucination of Weir's wife always appears with her eyes out also. This connects it to the lack of being able to see or comprehend through human mechanisms. The, the eyes don't work. The eyes won't be able to understand. Um, the quote from the film that's most uh, useful for this is that we won't need eyes to see. Um, the conclusions then of Event Horizon is that one cannot comprehend or confront the paralysis of finding the unthinkable. Event Horizon is a film fixated on the idea of guilt, and three of the main characters are all tormented by their internalized failings of past actions. Guilt paralyzes them and ultimately changes nothing. They cannot win or overcome the efforts of the ship, and arguably the ambivalence of the ending implies that everyone, even those that survive, are trapped in an eternal torment of violence. The conclusion of this film is that encountering the unthinkable will lead to death and madness. Very Lovecraftian. Um, guilt is unproductive and only serves to compound the danger. Something hopefully a bit more optimistic is found in Sunshine. Um, Sunshine leads in I'll outline the plot briefly. Um, Sunshine's plot is a, a sci-fi pulp premise, kind of seems borrowed right from Armageddon and um, the core. The premise involves the ship, the poorly titled Icarus 2, 
um, en route to the sun, which is in the process of dying, uh, its light going out far further than expected. This ship aims to ignite the sun by planting a nuclear bomb within it. Great idea, fabulous. But again, similarly to Event Horizon, they are distracted by a distress call from their previous ship, which again disappeared seven years prior on its mission to do the same. Sunshines is expressly interested with encountering the unthinkable. What we have here up at the top is a picture of one of the characters, Searle, who acts as the ship psychologist. He's not a major character by any means, but his presence at the introduction of the film sets the tone quite early on. The use of light in this film emphasizes how small people are. Often the yellow and orange fills the screen and people are rendered in claustrophobic terms in comparison. The sun is visualized in an almost spiritual capacity. A transcorporeal in the repeated emphasis is made on how humanity is incapable of surviving beyond it, even if they have only a limited capacity to understand it. Quote at the top is from Alex Garland, who is the screenwriter of um, Sunshine, and he's quite well known as well for being the director and writer of Annihilation and Ex Machina, which are both very good films as well. I definitely recommend. This quote is meant to illustrate that for Garland, the encounter with the sun is an encounter with the unthinkable. He personally views it as in quasi-religious terms, and the director Danny Boyle has also spoken on how this Ten, turn to the, towards the theological impacts the film. However, it does not reflect a new dark age in terms of ignoring the reality of the situation. And indeed it offers some comfort up at the top here is the death of Captain Canada, who rather than going back to the ship and running away from his fate, faces the sun and the soaring orchestral sounds of the soundtrack are meant to be triumphant and transcendent, even though he burns to death. The same can be said with Kappa, whose face, this picture might not have been the best, but it was the best I could find, um, whose face when he finally witnesses the magnificence of his theoretical creation, his bomb come to life, is one of wonder and joy. There is a use of mirroring in this film where the crew of the Icarus II are focused on the priority of surviving the human race must survive and their mission must be a success. In comparison, the previous mission led by Captain Pimbacker has tended towards fundamentalist dogma where their cosmic insignificance means that humanity is somehow fated to die. And it is him that becomes the final antagonist at the end. Sunshine instead with the crew of the Icarus II defies the fate and re repetition of the fate of the crew of the Icarus One and prioritizes a reverse Promethean narrative where humanity, while limited in its capacity, returns fire back to the gods and rather than be doomed to repeat, we can act beyond our paralysis through science and positive impact. So quickly, in conclusion, we looked at those two models earlier, Apocalypse and Jurd and Apocalypse. Um, my brain's gone, <laughs> Apocalypse inverted. And um, Sunshine potentially offers a third, which is Apocalypse Encountered. It reconciles the limitations of the unthinkable, how we can transcend our paralysis and stagnation by acknowledging cosmic horror, hopeful, and that the future might just be able to be a bit more brighter. And thank you very much. That is my presentation. Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, we won't uh, stop for questions uh, right now. Um, 
but thank you to, to Kate for that wonderful presentation. Uh, we'll have questions at the end for those that we have time for um, after this panel. For now, we'll move straight on um, to our second presenter of the Curator Stark offerings, um, which is going to be Oliver Rendell, uh, who will be presenting on post-millennial Lovecraftian humour. I will pass over straight away. Wonderful. Just uh, double check that the presentation is working when I can work it out. Oh my god. Uh, yeah, is that a... We, we can, can see that. We yep. can see that, yes. Thank you, Oliver. Awesome. Brilliant. So, uh, yeah, thank you, David, for uh, inviting us, as uh, as Kate said, to join for this event. It's lovely to see uh, some scholarship celebrating Lovecraft in the 21st century. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a pleasure to be talking to you today about post-millennial Lovecraftian humour. Um, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts. So the 21st century is witnessing a renaissance in cosmic horror and weird fiction, wherein, uh, to quote Lovecraft, a certain atmosphere of breathlessness and unexplainable dread of outer unknown forces is expressed by increasingly diverse forms and, to, uh, and catering to an increasingly diverse audience. This post-millennial boom has led to more scholarly appreciation of the weird uh, within the academy, new anthologies that celebrate underappreciated writers and a host of new talents updating the tradition. However, while such authors as Caitlin R. Kernan, uh, yeah, Victor Laval, uh, Jeff Vandermeer, um, Thomas Ligotti, Nicole Cushing, uh, are, are bringing new perspectives to the cosmic horror boom, H.P. Lovecraft remains a noteworthy figurehead. Despite his overt racism, which remains a source of consternation amongst fans and critics, Lovecraft has uh, risen from the depths, so to speak, um, over 80 years after his death to become, in the words of S.T. Joshi at least, a dark but compelling icon of popular culture, hence why we're here. Political and economic precarity brought about by the spread of neoliberalism, not to mention existential precarity brought about by the climate crisis and geopolitical tensions, quite timely comment now, I guess, have made a sense of insignificance and vulnerability increasingly uh, resonant with post-millennial audiences. For this reason, Carl Söderholm and Jeffrey Weinstock argued that we are living in an age of Lovecraft, a period in which this writer's work has assumed an unexpected intellectual and cultural influence by addressing increasingly insistent themes. Yeah, that's right. At the same time, Anglophone culture is undergoing a process of comedification, to, uh, to use the term employed by Lauren Berlant and Sian Nai. In other words, more and more social and professional interactions are expected to adopt an attitude of playfulness or comic irreverence. Uh, these forms of humour are increasingly demand, in demand in education, politics, journalism and religion and, uh, according to Burlington Nye at least, and instructional workshops like John Morial's Humour Works are likewise using humour to enhance management skills in corporate environments. According to contemporary theorist Nicholas Holm, humour as a cultural category has become not only a persistent characteristic of society, but a central demand that society places upon its citizens and consumers, an unavoidable aspect of how we approach and understand, and understand the world as a site of meaning, politics, and life itself. The expectation that people exhibit this sense of humour has impacted the uncultural cultural trends in the, uh, in the 21st century, unsurprisingly. Uh, including the recent resurgence in cosmic horror. The purpose of this paper is to outline the, the, the critical potential represented by cosmic horror's turn towards humour during this age of Lovecraft, which I argue results from a hyper-awareness hyper -awareness of humanity's precariousness combined with an increasing, uh, increasingly obligatory sense of humour. 
Lovecraft himself argued that a successful weird text or cosmic horror text must represent its subject matter with a seriousness and portentousness becoming its subject. This claim is challenged, I argue, by Jason Pargins, John Dies at the End, and Joseph Fink and Jeffrey Craner's Welcome to Night Vale, a novel. Unfortunately, I haven't the time to discuss entire franchises here. In fact, a full conference on Welcome to Night Vale, or the podcast it originated from at least, would only unpack a fraction of its cultural work. However, the novels I've selected are representative of two opposing responses to the post-millennial zeitgeist Lovecraft has been thriving on, and which Kate has actually already talked about a bit. That's useful. And both indicate significant ways that his legacy persists in popular culture. Excuse me. In terms of setting and overarching plot, both John Dies at the End and Welcome to Night Vale are heavily reminiscent of Lovecraft's fiction. In Pargin's novel, the narrator, Dave, and his best friend, John, are lower middle class Americans in their mid 20s who exist on the fringes of modern society, uh, bounce between temporary jobs or, and otherwise live without purpose. These protagonists live in a uh, Midwestern city only referred to as undisclosed, where unexplainable deaths and disappearances are a part of everyday life. After taking a drug called the source, these characters gain the ability to perceive the horrors that cause these mysterious events, along with the host of other threats that are invisible or otherwise beyond the understanding of ordinary humans. The novel then follows John and Dave uh, uh, through a series of overlapping encounters with these entities in and around their hometown, um, but by no means limited to their hometown, along with the morally questionable organizations that seek to control them. When compared to Pargan's novel, Welcome to Night Vale is even more closely tied to the narrative central setting. In the community of Night Vale, every conspiracy tr theory is true, and every aspect of this desert town is twisted by lo what Lovecraft once called a diseased fancy. Night Valians, as they're called, are preyed upon by literal things lurking literally in the shadows, we are told during the novel. Uh, the, the local television studio softball players have appendages that are unsettling to the human eye. Eldritch monstrosities comprise the city council and a sentient glow cloud represents the local school board. Like John and Dave's town, Nightvale is host to the numerous vague yet menacing government agencies. And there is a tangible sense that learning more about the universe would be terrifying and potentially maddening. This is made explicit in the novel through the stories of uh, Jackie Ferrero and Diane Creighton, the protagonists, the lonesome proprietor of a pawn shop and a introverted single mother, respectively. Like, the inhabit like all inhabitants of Night Vale, I should say, these protagonists willfully ignore the cosmic weirdness that surrounds them, while simultaneously uh, navigating a family crisis that brings the two protagonists together. <laughs> These broad plot summaries exhibit numerous hallmarks of a Lovecraftian tale. Social outcasts regretting their curiosity, a setting steeped in indefinable threats that rarely materialize, and secret organizations with questionable motives, not to mention otherworldly forces that the human mind cannot comprehend. However, a closer look at just a few instances of humor within these texts uh, demonstrates how, how much they differ. Idiomatic, riddled with era specific slang and profanity, John Dies in the End adopts a mode of speech made familiar to Western audiences via uh, American teen comedies from the 1990s and early 2000s. In many respects, this novel could be seen as an outlandish iteration of this same genre, subgenre, whatever you want to call it, which most famously spawned the American Pie franchise. Closely resembling the, the protagonists in these films, John and Dave blur the boundary between childhood and manhood and embody a futile desire to withdraw from social, political and moral concerns. <laughs> Though they encounter cosmic horrors that threaten their lives and sanity, John and Dave remain grounded by a willful immaturity that helps them cope with dangerous experiences and unsettling revelations. This juxtaposition between cosmic matters and John and Dave's puerile 
you could say, interactions with them is also a predominant source of humor in the novel. Take for instance, the following exchange between John and one particularly talkative cosmic monstrosity, a walking corpse that refers to itself as shitload because it is an animated, uh, it is an animated corpse. Uh, it is animated by a swarm of alien insects, sorry. This place, it's a horror show, shitload says. You suck the life from the innocent creatures of the world just so you can clock another day. Your machines that run on the terror and pain and mutilation of other lives. You'll scrape the world clean of every green living thing until starvation goes 187 on every one of your sorry asses. Your desperation to put off death, leading to the ultimate, uh, the ultimate death of everybody and everything. Dude, I can't believe you ain't all paralyzed by the pure naked horror of this place. After a long, long pause, John said, uh, Thank you. Using a colloquial register that appears ridiculous considering the profound subject matter, Shit, uh, Shitload adopts the same non-human lens that Lovecraft uses in his fiction and offers, arguably, a similarly bleak account of the human condition. John's response undercuts this dangerously conscious line of thought, though, and subverts it with willful narrow-mindedness. Ignoring the conceptual import of shitload speech, John addresses the only conversational element that he can detect. The moment invites humor, therefore, because thank you, is both an appropriate response and a willful, woeful, willful misreading of the situation. It is worth further noting that John is actually proving shitload correct here. Humans really do act like machines, the reader discovers, not just because of their uh, ceaseless consumption of, of resources, but because they are farcically uh, dedicated to conversational protocol. This aversion to thinking too hard, to uh, the piecing together of disassociated knowledge, if we're going to use Lovecraft's exact words, is at the heart of the politically disengaged state of existence that Pargan's narrative encourages. Echoing uh, the, the conservative values typically celebrated by both contemporary teen comedies and Lovecraft's own stories, human values and assumptions are depicted as ridiculous in John Dies in the end, at the end, but still essentially more desirable than their disruption. The final pages of the novel make this explicit through humor. In what amounts to an epilogue after the main narrative, John and Dave jump through a mysterious and potentially dangerous portal because it's a hot day and they want to play basketball in a slightly cooler alternative dimension. Here they meet the survivors on a post-apocalyptic version of Earth who inform them of a, uh, a prophecy that said that John and Dave would appear at some point and save humanity from the wasteland that humanity has ended up living in. Uh, however, uh, upon, uh, in, rather than helping these people, as the prophecy foretold, and upon discovering that the basketball courts will be destroyed in the apocalypse, John and Dave make an excuse, return to their own world, and simply continue their game. What the narrator describes as the other crappy dysfunctional universe is left to its own devices without a second thought. This subversion of a clearly demarcated narrative cliche is intended to be humorous and cathartic to some extent, because we see the protagonists, by the end of the novel, learning to live so-called normal lives despite their traumatic experiences. However, this conclusion to John and Dave's narrative also celebrates the apathetic pursuit of, uh, of self-interest at the expense of moral responsibility. What does it matter if people suffer, this position seems to suggest, if I cannot eradicate all suffering, then I am absolved from alleviating any of it. Through its ending and other such moments of cynicism, John Dies at the End advocates complacency under traditional social structures by appealing to a pervasive, politically disengaged state of mind, one that is undermining democracies around the globe in the 21st century. Uh, we could see, for instance, Ashley Laval's Death of Social Democracy, or Peter Mayer's Ruling the Void for Evidence. In stark contrast to this, 
Welcome to Night Vale invokes elements of Lovecraftian fiction alongside humour with a far more politically proactive aim in mind. Fink and Craner juxtapose cosmic horror with mundane reality, just as Pargan does, but they do it to emphasize a sense of community and normalize subjective experiences that are still discriminated against in the 21st century. Night Vale is an unnerving place where the uh, innate weirdness of the human experience is made explicit. This is a setting in which the dog park is a forbidden and highly dangerous place for both humans and dogs. A place where used car salesmen howl at the moon with hackles raised and fur on end, and where librarians are hideous predators, one glimpse of which makes death appear almost merciful. The fact that these mundane realities still exist and are continually referred to under their blatant misnomers generates humour from deadpan absurdity. Yet the omniscient, godlike narratorial voice helps create further humour out of this process by juxtaposing feelings of contentment and, and comfort and satisfaction against bleak proclamations on the cold, cruel nature of the universe. Take, for instance, the following lines, which appear when introducing one of the novel's protagonists. Jackie understood the world and her place in it. She understood nothing. The world and her place in it were nothing, and she understood that. Fink and Craner's wordplay here invites humour by repeatedly twisting the reader's interpretation of the words understood and nothing. The initial idiom suggests that Jackie is a down-to-earth adult who, who is firmly in control of her life. She understood the world and her place in it. Then we are told that Jackie actually understood nothing, an apparent contradiction of the previous line that reframes her as lost or naive or perhaps angst-ridden. The final line of the pre the, the final line then subverts this subversion while impressing upon the reader a Lovecraftian view of humanity. Jackie understands that in relation to an infinite, impassionate cosmos, she has negligible inherent value. Implicitly then, Jackie is, from the perspective of the godlike narrator, appropriately well adjusted considering her existential predicament. This unexpected reification of the initial idiom is thus structured to elicit humor, while also allowing a tendril of cosmic horror to sneak into the narrative. In contrast to John Dies at the End, Welcome to Night Vale uses the articulation of a Lovecraftian worldview to normalize an attitude of acceptance and empathy rather than conservative apathy. To understand uh, this understated yet pointed message of inclusivity is perhaps best epitomized by Diane's son, Josh, around which the novel's plot revolves. Josh can literally shapeshift into creatures, uh, any creatures, for reasons that are never explained in the novel, and this instability causes him some problems when falling early romantic relationships. There was a girl Josh liked, the reader is told, who only liked Josh when he was bipedal. Josh does not always like to be bipedal and found this news disappointing. There was a boy Josh liked who liked Josh when he was a cute animal. Josh always liked being a cute animal, but Josh's subjective sense of the word cute was different from the boys. This was another disappointment for Josh and also for the boy who did not find giant centipedes cute at all. The Night Valian concept of normalcy is drawn attention to here specifically by what Fink and Cranot leave unacknowledged. Josh's transformation becomes the primary focus of this passage in a clever allegory for the emotional and physical changes that occur during puberty and arguably during any relationship. The weirdness of the setting itself is then a secondary focus emphasized by the fact, uh, em em emphasized by the fact nobody questions how Josh can shapeshift in this manner and his perhaps unsettling notion that giant, sins, giant insects could be cute. Both of these elements are drawn attention to by the punchline, which highlights the strangeness of the Nightvalian inter Night interactions by the boy's understated reaction, reaction to being confronted by a giant centipede. But what is emphatically not drawn attention to is Josh's romantic attachment to two different genders. In the town of Nightvale, 
LGBTQ plus relationships, atypical family structures, and ethnic, cultural, and physical diversity are all presented as far more normal and far less worthy of comment than the Lovecraftian monstrosities and unexplainable events that make up everyday life. In view of so many human, inhuman, and metaphysical threats, the difference between individual identities is simply not addressed unless it is uh, unless it is pertinent to the narrative itself. As the, narr as the narrator informs the reader, not everyone gets to know everything about everybody. And this pointed respect of diversity and indeed privacy represents a timely rewriting of Lovecraft's notorious conservatism. Writing on the epistemological void depicted by Welcome to Night Vale, Lyne Henriksen writes that in a world in free fall, yeah, in a world in free fall, uh, different lines of disorientation can be drawn and new navigational tools found, creating different but never static foundations. In other words, undermining all notions of normalcy enables Fink and Craner to imagine new, more equitable versions of normal. In light of the hostile forces that comprise it, Night Vale is overwhelmingly an inclusive community that everyone is equally allowed to enjoy and fear. As Jackie notes, one of the protagonists, this is our nightmare. An overarching, this overarching contrast, I should say, between John Dies in the End and Love, Welcome to Night Vale is representative of the multifaceted position Lovecraft has come to hold in post-millennial popular culture. On the one hand, we have a neoliberal continuation of Lovecraft's conservatism, epitomized by John and Dave leaving the other crappy dysfunctional universe to its own devices. On the other hand, we have the undermining of, of contemporary values and assumptions in the hope that we can replace them with something better, a community in which we can put aside personal differences and make this placid island of ignorance in the Black Seas of Infinity as comfortable and as inclusive as possible. It should be noted that, uh, that humorous responses to Lovecraft's work are by no means limited to uh, the 21st century. And, and they reflect a range of ide ideological positions that this dichotomy that I've presented here uh, oversimplifies somewhat. Nevertheless, these novels show that Lovecraft's legacy is alive and well 80 years after his death, and that it remains worthy of critical scrutiny because of, not despite, the contrasting political values new iterations of it represent. Suffice to say, humor has played a key role in updating this tradition of cosmic horror for, uh, for the predilections of 21st century audiences, and has helped them engage with the same themes and concepts that Lovecraft intended for butter or worse. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oliver, for that fantastic piece. Um, likewise, we're gonna we're gonna plow straight through to the end of the panel and have our discussions at uh, the end. I've got a load of notes written down. <laughs> I know for sure. I'm sure others are in the same boat. Uh, but for now, we shall handle hand back over um, to the MMU panel, and we've got uh, Frederick to finish us off with. Frederick Blanc. Uh, who will be giving uh, his presentation on Drawn Towards the Unknown Sea Deeps from Thalassophobia to a Thalassic Feeling in H.P. Lovecraft's Oceanic Weird Fiction. Um, take us away, Frederick. Thank you, David, and thank you everyone for uh, joining us. Um, very pleased with the opportunity. Quinn just told me, this is a very sort of tentative part of, of my research or what we'll see today. So I'll probably say I'm either too little or too much, and I'm very much welcome your questions and comments. Uh, and there we go. So uh, in today's talk, uh, I'll be discussing how seemingly contradictory feelings of thalassophobia and thalassophilia intersect with, within H.P. Lovecraft's famous short story, The Shadow of Rainsmith. That is how the fear and disgust towards the oceanic environment in the narrative is ultimately complicated by an ultimate reversal and acceptance of a seemingly alien ecologies by its protagonist. In doing so, my aim is to articulate the movement towards a particular ontology and perhaps even affect or body aquatic, a kind of philosophy feeling that in part delineates the transcorporeal, interconnective and becoming with and submerging in the undersea experience 
come to highlight. The narrative, as we shall see, concerns itself with the monstrous liminalities of a possible amphibian body. Literature and culture are replete with representations of creatures that embody the crucial liminality between land and water, uh, between the human and the non-human, in the guise of half-human, half-fish beings or monsters. Merfolks, Selkies, and other sea monsters populate our imagination. And in part, as we shall see with H.P. Lovecraft's short story, uh, come to exemplify the unknowable other of the deep blue sea, as well as a fear of devolution, a situated in the ocean, and atavistic past that, in destabilizing the human, also alludes, whether ironically or unintentionally, in this case, to the alluring power of the sea as possible re-enchanted future. As I said, I add to this, to this notion of a certain plastic feeling, as a tentative move of mind towards articulating these ambivalent and contradictory feelings. I borrow here from Sigmund Freud's frustrated attempt at defining what the French writer Romain Roland defined as a, quote, feeling which you would like to call a sensation of eternity, a feeling as of something limitless, unbounded, as it were, oceanic, unquote. One that furthermore corresponds to, he says, a feeling of an indissoluble band uh, of the bond, of being one with the external world as a whole. Unquote. This feeling of interconnectivity with the world at large, equated with the immensity and fluidity of the ocean, serves as a, as a connective link between the undersea and an effective response to its particular contours, in contradistinction with that of land. Margaret Cohen drew attention to the often fantastic and gothic language used by divers in the attempt to express in words what they saw and felt underwater, and them that often fell short into their own mission you know, begin to encompass the experience of being submerged. While well, Abilene, in turn, engaging with the plurality of experience, accounts, and fiction that the undersea has inspired, explains how, quote, the underwater worlds of human imagination seem endlessly changeable, and the history of representation of underwater environments is complex, plural, and often contradictory in both forms and significances, unquote. Helen Ro Helen Rosewodowski, in turn, again, details how, quote, engagement with the underwater, human engagement with the underwater over deep time and cross cultures, suggests the possibility of alternative models for possible human relationship with the undersea that might have been imaginable in the past. Unquote. Turning my attention to new materialist applications of the ocean, as we shall see, as a particularly inspiring example, is that of Stacey Alemo's notion of transcorporality, which will be very important here, as sees, quote, the human as a substantially and perpetually interconnected with the flows of substances and the agencies of environment. Unquote. I engage with Lovecraft's The Shadow Winds Myth in this case as an ambivalent tale which combines a ontological and grotesque classophobia with a transcorporeal classophilia. Taken to the, together, these contradictory feelings sketch the contours of the classic feeling an affect of both fear and wonder at and under the sea. So, The Shadow of Innsmouth is a tale of a young man, unnamed in the text, but mentioned as a one Robert Olmsted in Lovecraft's notes to the novella. He travels across New England and discovers the, new, the nearby existence of a small, decrepit town of Innsmouth on the Atlantic coast. The town, he learns, is an isolated community, apparently secluded within a coastal landscape of quote, wide salt marshes, desolate and unpeopled, unquote on the one side and the boundless Atlantic Ocean on the other. What he discovers in the horror as he explores the rundown and dilapidated town is a population of fish frog hybrids emerging from the seashore. The town's inhabitants, he learns, have intermingled with deep ones and the immortal species of fish-like humanoids from across the ocean and under the waters. When all enough, they would travel into the sea to join their ancestors in the cities of the deep ones. Robert Olmsted, initially appalled at the discovery, escapes in the dead of night. In the final twist in the novel, novella later on. Omsil himself later discovers he is, in fact, by way of one of his ancestors, a cousin of the Insmuthians, and bound also to join them underneath the waves, thereby embracing his own hybridity and called, acquiring what he calls the Insmuth look. Unquote. The seaside town of Insmuth is inextricably bound up with its many points of contact with water, be they indeed the sea, the coast, the rivers, or the marshlands that surround the town on all sides. The aquatic spaces construct an intricate hybrid geography that once reifies the oceanic as a space of horror and monstrosity at the same time that it suggests its fundamental appeal and capacity of this wonder and fascination. In this way, this coastal geography mirrors in its concatenation the metamorphic qualities of the deep ones and the insmuthian siblings. One of the epicenters of this tension between horror and wonder is the site of the Devil's Reef. Standing beyond the town's harbor, the reef functions as a nexus which connects the different gothic and weird elements in the narrative, as well as to the sublime, so often related to the sea. 
Looking at it for the first time as he travelled to Innsmouth, Ormskin described it as they quote, long black lines scarcely rising above the water, declaring a suggestion of odd, latent malignancy. Unquote. The screening of the reef's malignancy is complicated by a different one, that of a, quote, subtle, curious sense of becoming, of beckoning, which seems surprising to the grim repulsion, unquote. These contradictory feelings of disgust and attraction, which intra diegetically will prove themselves a result of narrative's own complex relationship, see, underscore an intricate construction of the ocean and space at once dangerous and enchanting, where the reef and the seas around it themselves are car carry a threat of invasion akin to that of the deep one's monstrous body, foreshadowing the fastophobic feelings of dread and horror, uh, and horror at the lake, bursting forth from the waves come to the body. Returning to Cecilia Lemo's useful concept of transcorporality, I situate the hybridity of the protest and movements within a larger context of ontological interplay between the humans and the other than human at the ocean's edge. Alemo understands, quote, movement across bodies, quote, as a key element of a conceptualization. She contends that such an underlying thread, quote, opens up a mobile space that acknowledges the often unpredictable and unwanted actions of human bodies, non human creatures, ecological systems, chemical agents, confrontational. Um, uh, and other actors, sorry, unquote. This emphasis on the unpredictability and often confrontational nature of movements between and across bodies resonates with the central tension at work in the novella. That is, it proposes a framework for which we can examine the fear of hybridity and miscegenation in the shadow wings with situates at the coast and in the ocean, alongside the undercurrents of our lyric fascination that such a hybridity also provokes. Others consider the denizens of Innsmouth in light of their particular relationship to water, not only in terms of their own physicality, but of their own hydrosocial experience of life. When I go beyond the monstrous examines the novel's villain characterization of an abject, yet alluring and ultimately embraced aquatic ontology. The narrative in this construction of the seaside town of Innsmouth is a, as a place of decay and unnerving transformation concerns itself with the intertwining of bodies and geography, with a crumbling and haunted town invaded by water, mirrors the inhabitants and narrators' bodies themselves haunted by the ever encroaching ocean. The latter becomes a contested site of hybridity in metamorphosis. Indeed, Innsmouth in this regard is a haunted space with a very shadow that is found draped over its buildings and inhabitants underlying the consequences of the past and its lingering after effects on the present as well as the future. The coast, in keeping with the waves that forever come and break at the shoreline, threatened to invade and inundate before receding into the sea once more in a literal, and there I say literal, uh, figurative sense of erosion. To speak of a haunting in this context is to situate the town within the context of its demise and decay, where superimposed onto any ruin is the intact building that it once was. Jimmy Packham argues that the, quote, coastal landscape is one of the competing tradition in which the palimpsestic layers of history remain visible, where plurality of historical times and cultural practices exist in successive layers without ever quite overwriting one another. Unquote. The concept of, of the palimpsest here aptly describes the salient layering of geography and ontology that Innsmouth represents. The narrative makes clear this sense of layering of different epochs, states, as well as physicality that seems to coalesce around Innsmouth and its inhabitants, where the succession of events that led to its degradation can be clearly appreciated at the same time as a concatenated temporality of the Innsmouth and its transformation reinforces the palimpsestic nature of the seaside town. The idea of a haunting, moreover, brings to the fore what some have understood as the ontological nature of the oceanic, where the past forever returns and is embedded in the present. David Punter, for example, suggests that the philosophic independence of our relationship to the sea can be seen as a, quote, cardinal example of conflation, the inseparability of the weird and the ontological one. Indeed, Punter draws attention to the double nature of the oceanic monster as he argues that, quote, for, for all the what might emerge dripping and incomprehensibly just later, at low tide might appear to be the totally other, it might also have the contours of a half-recognizable half self, and thus relate to the theory revenant. His assertion comes as a partial rebuttal to China Mivel's idea that the weird is fundamentally beyond the uncanny principle put forward by Freud, and an axiom of the completely unknown. The deep ones bridging the ontological gap between land and sea embody a form of haunting where the aquatic past of the human becomes superimposed onto its present. In this case, as in others, interestingly, haunting is an inescapably, inescapably felt and embodied experience. For Susan Hareholt argues, it is something that is called fluid and experienced by and through the body, unquote. Katie Shaw, too, highlights how the ontological as an understanding of the layering of past, present, and future collapses temporality. The spectre, she argues, quote, dissolves the separation between now and then, unquote, as it is also, quote, mark, 
and it also marks the point at which multiple temporalities meet and cross. Unquote. In this regard, Innsmouth is understood and is understood as a perpetually haunting presence, a space of spectral material, materiality, forever visited by the specters of its more glorious industrial past. The buildings and the streets that the remaining inhabitants of the town occupy are found in literal a process of erosion and ruination as water spills over from coast, river, and marshes. Innsmouth is haunted by water, prefigured as an amalgamation of its past as, as a more successful seaport. It's present as a decaying waterfront overrun by a collection of bodies of water and its potential futures of erosion and invasion. The Innsmouthian too are haunted. Their bodies and throughout all transformational narratives become a literalized site of contention, a haunted space between specters of the past and future. In the monstrous body, all temporality collapses as the slow transformation of the young and human looking gives way to the excessively aquatic nature of the old. Moreover, their haunted and hybrid qualities coalesce within a framework of degeneration and misgeneration that reify a set of fast forward discourses that locate within the sea and its mutable liminality, the anxieties pertaining to the dislocation of humankind's stable self. Indeed, the claustrophobia in Lovecraft's novella unveils the oceanic as, a fun as fundamentally destabilizing. The boundaries of temporality, speciality, as well as body integrity are all increasingly shattered as the discovery of the metamorphic qualities of the deep points and their descendants destroys any possibility of the traditional, stable, white Anglo-American self. Beyond the outer layer of repulsion, the fear of degenerative misgenation so associated with Lovecraft's writing lies a definite articulation of the interstitial nature of humanity. So for A. Reinhardt, Rodney argues that Lovecraft's racist anxieties are centered around his quote, understanding of and preoccupation with atavism, of evolutionary throwbacks, survivals, and regressions in modern industrial society. Unquote. The fin de siècle and the early 20th century saw the rise of evolutionary theories that were promptly co opted by social and racial discourse. Charles Darwin alluded to the oceanic past of all mammals, including humans, noting that they are quote, prob probably derived from an ancient marsupial animal. And this through a long line of diversified forms, either from some reptile like or some amphibian like creature, and this again from some fish like animal. Fears that humankind may revert back to a more primitive past, located within non white populations, alleged atavistic characteristics that might spread to white Western societies if intermarrying was encouraged or condoned. Visions of an aquatic evolutionary past came to evoke fears of an unstable lineage, a tottering tree of life that could easily be scaled back. It is no surprise, therefore, that Lovecraft would locate his tale of racial degeneracy within the locus of the sea. The Deep One's grotesque liminality reveals the instability of the boundaries between human and non-human. The prism of the weir here only heightens its insecurity, whereas Pontamuses, as Pontamuses, quote, perhaps we do not always accept that the abhuman, the monstrous, apart from being a side effect of our humanizing categories, but rather analyze them. In other words, the seemingly monstrous shapes of the inhabitants of Innsmouth and the challenging of ostensible boundaries participate in the perpetual redrawing since by their hybrid nature, they exemplify the very process of abstraction that create them, thereby exposing specifically classical big tendencies and anxieties. <clears throat> Moreover, the important narrative twist at the end of the Shadow of Innsmouth uncovers the narrative's own hybridity and affiliation with the viewpoint, as well as his own future transformation, transformation into an immortal fish-like being. He too will take this seat. As an active standing for the human perspective, Olmsted's trajectory further collapses any possibility of differentiation between us and them. As Mark Fisher details, quote, Lovecraft's stories frequently involve a catastrophic integration of the outside into an interior that is retrospectively revealed to be a delusive, delusive envelope, a sham, where I am it, the better I am they. Inside and outside break down into one dim dimensional uncovered reality that levels any attempt at separation of foreground and anxious uniform uniformity with surface and depth are ultimately revealed as the same, much like the crushing waves and undulating um, depths are part of the are part of the overarching yet uncontainable structure of the sea. The mutability of the narrative's ontology also exemplifies Mihail Bakhtin's definition of a grotesque body as one quote in the act of becoming. It is never finished, never completed. It is continually continually built, created, and builds and creates another body. This perspective highlights once again now the heart of the Innsmouthians and narrates grotesque forms that's a promise of mutability and cyclicality that connects them to the oceanic at all levels of temporality, when the once amphibian returns to the hybridity of the ocean as a primordial site of becoming. Character of the of Allen is clear, this unfolding genealogy, using that, quote, it seems that human folks have got a kind of relation to such water beasts, that everything in life come out of water once and only needs a little change to go back again. 
Thus, even humanity's origin is dissented, relocated into the sea, which not only derails any further idea of land-based supremacy, but also alludes to another reversal that reimagines deep ones, not the human, as a more consistent form of the species in perpetual evolution. Perhaps, indeed, it is humanity that is straying from the evolutionary path, a troubled parenthesis in the history of life. What these two threads, the ontological and the grotesque, reveal, furthermore, is an intriguing, intriguing ambivalence that brings into view a complex understanding of the oceanic as a cycle of fear and fulfillment, of unfamiliarity and kinship, which unfolding onto each other comes to form and inform a discourse at once classophobic and classophilic. That is, the narrator's view of the ocean and its metamorphic qualities is ultimately turned on its head as he discovers and accepts his hybrid lineage. As his body slowly transforms, the dreams he at first considered to be nightmares increasingly reveal his newfound enjoyment of, this, of the sea, as more and more he declares that the, quote, tense extremes horror are lessening, and that he feels clearly drawn toward the unknown sea deeps instead of fearing them, unquote. Further, further detailing how he hears and does strange things in sleep and awakes with a kind of exaltation instead of terror, unquote. Fear of the unknown subsides into unfolding joy and acceptance of the interconnected ontologies of human with the non-human. As New argues, Holmes says, transformation is indeed a quote, form of becoming, an exultant acceptance of the universe's modest ontology and an acknowledgement that human beings have always been a part of the world in itself in all its weird monstrosity. Quote, the novella's exhibit thus comes to transcend the philosophical in favor of a philosophic relationship to the oceanic. As such, The Shadow of Innsmouth is one of Lovecraft's more embedded stories, revealing itself as a complicated representation of the oceanic as a locus of both philosophia and philosophia, while racist discourses of generation and misgeneration are just opposed with, with sentiments of aquatic, aquatic exaltation. The grotesque aquatic hybridity that towns and inhabitants exhibit is reminiscent of Jerry Jerome Cohen's construction of the monsters as a being who simultaneously repulses and entices. As he says, quote, awakening one to the pleasures of the body, to the simple and fleeting joys of being frightened or frightening, to the experience of mortality and corporality. Unquote. The experience of life at the shorelines and the water goes beyond, goes beyond the horror of metamorphosis. The old ones and the transforming in smooth things may represent imagination, yet the allure of the sea is all, also ever present. In this regard, the shadow of Innsmouth fundamentally concerns itself with becomings highlighting the transient and ever-changing nature of the body and the interface between land and sea, as well with a certain classic feeling, which connects horror and grotesque transformation with the affect of a messy submersion. The notion of becoming is a useful tool to address the mutability, mutable qualities of bodies and agencies, as well as a perpetually interconnected nature. The processes and ontologies of becoming are clearly, as another emphasizes, not a self-contained or discrete configuration, but deeply embedded in a network of interconnections and agencies that intertwine the human and the other than human. Becoming smoothing is thus, to echo Donna Haraway's articulation in the Cthulhu scene, a question of becoming with. Such a process, she, pro she proposes, is called always someplace and not no place, entangled in worldly. The novella tellingly underscores the importance of sea trade and commercial fishing in the construction of Innsmouth as a, play as a space deeply entangled in the oceanic. It is a collusion between its inhabitants and the deep ones from far away and on the water that provide for bountiful fish in ways that are described as going beyond the traditional fish and outfield and non hybrid at the ocean's edge. This to underscore a life with a sea that links the insmoothings more deeply uh, to the environment. Amidst the decrepitude of the town, the insmoothings are also tellingly described as participating in leisure activities and more sports than only foreshadow the monstrosity of the peace and points, but also the intricacies of their double ontology. Indeed, they were, quote, very fond of the water and swam a great deal in both river and harbor. And for whilst, while again, quote, swimming races out to Devil Reef were very common and everyone in sight seemed well able to share in this arduous sport. Unquote. This alludes to the particular experience of the water, not as a space of danger or even mercantile endeavor, but as a space and place of enjoyment and life. And smoothians and their growth has become allied themselves with the personal agencies of water. The narrative here provides an unweird representation of life at the shoreline with distortions of body and mind, lecturalize the particular ontologies associated with life at the junction between land and the ocean. <clears throat> the Shadow of Ernest Smith presents the reader with an intriguing, an intriguing tale of oceanic monstrosity, where the existence of, of a coexisting aquatic civilization undermines the supremacy of the human and their monopoly as the only sentient agency on Earth, and more specifically, its oceans. Through the prism of the weird, the narrative dramatizes, dramatizes a deep-seated anxiety towards the ocean, which imagined its unknown contours as the site of monsters other with an all-too-familiar physicality. It crystallizes its first big responses that not only relate to the fear of danger, 
on danger and shoreline, but crucially to the transformative aspect of such danger. It is the ultimate fear, in other words, of becoming not itself, to be metamorphosed into something that is not us, but something else. In a successive erosion of the self, the sea hollows out the human onset into an otherworldly viewpoint, manifesting what New York is the only reprieve in Lovecraft's vision of a terrifying universe, that of the, quote, dissipation of the self, and again, quote, a loss of ego akin to madness. Unquote. The sea erodes itself as much as it does the shore, polishing it into something altogether different. The narrative, however, goes beyond the transformation of the body and portrays a confirmating transformation of the mind as the Olmstead comes to enjoy the fate that awaits him. Here, multiple lines of interpretation are open, just such an acceptance can easily be understood as the ultimate testament to an invading monstrosity able to pollute the body and mind, a vision that could easily align with the social and political views of Lovecraft himself against immigration and racial equality. Uh, much of the metaphorical substance of these monsters and grotesque creatures is equally and rather clearly a product of his fear of immigrants and minorities. Nevertheless, intricate narratives like the Shadow of Innsmouth articulate their reactionary concerns in a disturbingly ambiguous way. Olmsted's choice to finally embrace his complicated heritage is as much a proof of his own visionary, a shorthand for white America's alleged decline in the turn of the century, as it is of a change of heart with regards to the qualities of unconventional systems. While Lovecraft may have intended this narrative as cautionary and tale, the text stands as a complex exploration of human non human interrelationships. But the decentering of the human within the ontological dynamics of cosmology, the cosmological ironically gives way, if not to an appreciation and this to a concern, understanding of the fluidity of the human condition. This reading highlights a tentative and early example of a move towards the class of feeling and the pains of the we at sea, and an arising class of feeling of honesty experience of being one with the ocean in this regard as a whole. Uh, that uses the metaphor of the aquatic hybrid to articulate the, the affect of being underwater and feeling connected to its totality, plunged into an unknown yet inspiring abyss. A philosophical reading of Lovecraft's oeuvre, whose influence on the aesthetics, aesthetics, motives, and ethos of all shared representations in 20th and 21st century literature, cinema, and popular culture cannot be overstated, contributes to a reevaluation re of the weird and gothic horror of the sea open new avenues for thinking the latter not only as a space of horror, but as one where terrifying anxieties and alternative ontologies can be renegotiated. Thus, and to conclude, while the sea has very much retained the power to excite all fears of the other and the unknown, as in exemplifying Lovecraft's fiction, more and more it has also become a site of blasphemic exaltation in recent years, where the transformative qualities of the mutable sea are seen not as a danger or a curse, but as a blessing that reinvigorates and re enchants the possibilities of unconventional and unifying ways of thinking the world around us, when in an overarching sense of being and belonging, which I have tentatively called a class of feeling here. The Insmoothians present an amphibious ontology that, beyond the horrors of their form, emphasizes at once miscegenation, also leisure, and posthuman ontology. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frederick. And if I could invite all of our presenters back on, I'll briefly come on myself. There, where we go, why not? Uh, so we have a, a short while um, through to, to have a, a little discussion. Um, I've certainly got some questions. If anybody has some questions uh, for our three panelists, uh, then please uh, do drop some uh, comments either in the chat or put your hand up so that I can, your virtual hand up, um, so that we can call uh, on you. Um, I love those. Um, I am torn between, yeah, I'm, I'm having to not just rave about um, both the talks themselves and things that are in there. I, I adore Event Horizon, for instance. Um, one of my absolute, one of my absolute favourites. Um, so what I, I do have um, a question, I suppose, for ev everyone. I, I would say maybe Kate and Oliver mostly, um, but Frederick bringing in aspects of the contemporary here. I, well, I do have a separate question for you. Um, so there's been a focus here on sample texts from the sort of uh, post 2000 era. And I was wondering if that that brought the indication of because I was trying to think of equivalent texts from the um, the postmodern if if you, if you like the seventies eighties and nineties and thinking 
about things like uh, there's a natural comparison to John Dies at the end in in aspects of Hitchhiker's Guide. There's aspects of Event Horizon with Solaris, um, and aspects of Sunshine with 2001 aspects of Night Vale maybe with Beetlejuice or aspects of things that are, are touched on there. And the 90s attempts to bring in things like the Wes Craven Apocalypse trilogy uh, of what the weird looked like there. Uh, and I suppose from a, uh, in terms of the Thalassic, I've, I've spent less time thinking about that, but, but something like Sphere and you had the Abyss. Um, do you th do you think, and really this is an open question, uh, that there is a marked difference? So where where has that shift? Why, where is that, and why has that evolution gone from some of those treatments of those ideas then that that distinguishes um, Annihilation and Sunshine, which have I think similar, you know, that that positivist that positive feeling to 2001, Event Horizon to Solarius, Beetlejuice to, to Night Vale, really anyone for you to take. It's just a provocation, I suppose. Do you want to go first, Kate? So, uh, yeah, I, there's, if we talk about like context and how that's uh, brought about these ideas before and after the millennium, I think really what we're talking about, at least from well, my opinion, but also a bit of the research as well, is it, it comes down to the internet. A lot of it comes down to the pervasiveness of how people, at least in developed countries, perceive the world through the lens of social media these days and how that intrinsically changes, uh, that it destabilizes everything. Um, the sort of the entertainment circuits, if you want to pick up on Mark Fisher's terms, you can't have a conference without talking about Mark Fisher, it seems. Um, the whole idea of, yeah, nothing seems stable anymore. I mean, we can talk about 2016 and the, the advent of post-truth age and things like that, um, but you can, it, it goes back way further. Uh, James Brindle, James Bridle, uh, yeah, Brindle, I think he's called, has got a book called The New Dark Age, and it's entirely a study of the impact that uh, technology, not just social media, but digital technologies and technologies in industry, um, and in social spaces, in fact, and, and it traces how that's affected our worldview at a very fundamental level. And it, the title, as it suggests, is taken directly from Lovecraft. Um, and I think, uh, as, the, as Eugene Thacker, the, the theorist that Kate referenced, has done a lot about how um, pessimism has, has changed and become a lot more... Uh, fundamental to a lot more different ideologies. It's no longer just the preserve of the, the privileged white philosopher who's got too much time on his hands anymore. Now it is a, a much more pervasive feeling shared by a lot more communities um, since that time. But as you say, there's, there's precedence. Uh, I've got a whole chapter in my PhD about Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and I will rave about that as much as you will rave about uh, Event Horizon. Oh, I, I will. But uh, yeah, uh, that's a lot more socio. It's not corrected. There's uh, yeah, that's a lot more about socioeconomic, especially in Britain during that time. Uh, Pope like Thatcher, um, yeah, advent of neoliberalism, both sides of the Atlantic. Um, that sort of deep destabilization that would then become so. Um, so central to our lives in the age of social media, at least, was being sort of implemented on a sort of socio-political, socio-economic scale through those policies at that time. So you had the same sort of uh, uncertainty just in every, uncertainty and vulnerability and um, yeah, a sense of insignificance. The more individualistic you are within a rapidly corporatized structure, I guess, the less you're important. And I think that's what makes Lovecraft's ideas resonate so much um, with those audiences. Sorry, I just went on for ages then. That was probably something better that Kate, Kate could talk about that better than me, I think. I was waiting for you to talk about Hitchhiker's Guide, man. <laughs> Another time. <laughs> oh, oh. I'm so glad David mentioned Solaris because I always, I absolutely love Solaris. Even I've got even a soft spot for the remake, which might be a bit of sacrilege to say. Um, at least it's, kind of interesting, kind of in an opposite way from Ollie, I think 
we've simultaneously become less interested in space and more interested in space. So like the last, it's been a good number of decades since the last manned space flight outside of um, trips to the International Space Station. The challenge is that a disaster happened, which was huge in terms of sort of hammering home the threat and the danger of actually going into space and arguments about its value in terms of money and in terms of life. Um, so I think at least for the for the weird as it exists in space, there's actually not a lot being done there at the moment. It kind of seems to hang out at the 90s, mid 2000s. There's not a lot of movies set in space these days, which uh, which is easier for me because it means I have to watch less of them for my PhD. But it is obviously very sad. Um, because I think it, there might be this turn due to increased discussions about Mars as like a second option. I, I know Elon Musk never shuts up about it, um, about how Mars might be, you know, the, the fail safe and how realistic that is, is not. <laughs> um, but I think at least when it comes to space, the, the weird is really useful as an arena where it's just there's there's very little external to it there's just people trapped in a steel tin can lost usually um which is one of the reasons why event horizon and sunshine can lean so heavily into it and it doesn't surprise me that alex garland went on to do ex machina and annihilation which are probably a bit more towards what is in current these days which is more of the weird through I guess the surreal I would argue the weird surreal but integrated into a sort of reality not so far as removed as space oh, I'm sorry David you only mean <laughs> I mean Annihilation I suppose is a perfect example of a film that would have been set in space until very recently I think The Endless oh. another uh not a Garland film but another recent I love, love The film. Endless I'm so glad someone's seen it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that would have been set in space until very recently. Um, Absolutely. There's a, uh, and there's the same, some... my, is it My Name is Monday? Or the... the, the... Oh, the whatever, whatever Happened to Monday? Whatever Happened to Monday. Another, yeah, another similar. Um, but yeah, thank you. Frederick, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, well, so I haven't seen many of the films that were, that were discussed. Uh, I'm much like I'm looking towards the ocean, right, to the seas rather than yeah. than through the space. But as as we've discussed many times with Kate, actually, we we do see a, there's a similarity between where where I kind of have, um, interest in this conversation is that uh, there's a similarity between space and the ocean. Mm. I think that's the the those are at least on a metaphor level, uh, metaphorical level, those those two intersect. That's why when you look at a great example now is is underwater. Yep. Not the best film, but a, a very interesting way to look at, at to use Lovecraft from a proper uh, cosmic horror, because it is cosmic, it's just that it's, it's turned towards down to the deeps, which is another other form of co uh, cosmic horror, I would say, mm. uh, where it's, you know, you see Cthulhu, uh, and I think that when you look at the way they are dressed, the way they interact with the environment, it's very much like they were in space, uh, only with more pressure rather than you know, and less radiation and, and more pressure. Um, but there's, but yeah, there's, there's a sense. But to, answer, to try and answer what, of what changed, um, i say if I can preempt this question, is the idea that at least when it comes to Oceanic, what's very interesting now is you see a lot of people reusing Lovecraft and all the weird author like Hoxton, uh, for example, uh, to, to, to reimagine, re enchant um, ideas of. of, of, of of a sort of new way that is that I think sorry, okay, let me back title for a second. I think that when it comes to the oceanic, one of the most important part of the what could be the new weird now, etc., uh, is the organicity uh, of the weird, the deep sense of, of the bodily there. And it's now used by a uh, particular author of of, uh, sort of um, black and brown authors also uh, that use. Uh, or all of in, in sort of queer studies that use this sense of of the of of of, of, of the weird of the of 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 the not the monster but the, the, this sense of, of the hybrid being 
to talk about different things and to re-enchant um, the racist and, and original ideas of Lovecraft. You can see it with, with River Solomon's Deep, which I work, also Lagoon, uh, and a number of other, um, other texts that, like Lovecraft Country has shown recently, uses Lovecraft, but sort of like subverts Lovecraft. And it's shown in the ocean, I would say, as well. Sorry, that was long winded. No, that's great. I, I just, I wonder the specific question I kind of wanted to ask. I mean, it kind of comes back to the centre of what you were saying, probably is already implied in what you said. Do you perceive thoracic feeling as a particular distinct form of affect? I think, so I'm, this is where I'm working on, yeah. is that my interest is, is this sense of, um, yeah, an idea of, of submersion in white, it feels what, what is the affect of the underwater uh, experience there and how it connects with, with weird and with horror there. Uh, and I'm not quite sure. Uh, I'm working on it and, and I accept um, uh, opinions. I think there's something specific uh, about um, being, the, the, about the emotions on one hand, the cognitive emotions on one hand, and the body bodily affect and experience uh, on that in the sense of, of I would say the, the sort of the phenomenological idea of the affect there of being emerged that's what I'm fascinated with at the moment and I'm not quite sure uh, if I would call it a specific different affect but I I'm that's where I'm working towards and yeah yeah it was something from reading your abstract because I mean I mean my background's in performance so I'm I'm an affect guy and having particularly with an emphasis on kind of scare attractions and uh, commercial horror uh, and having done time in like attractions called HMS Hell and like underwater cursed ship events. Yeah. Like, that, you know, if, if I, I would never have used the term like thoracic feeling, but, but having read what you've written, you know, it was immediately something that I attached to as being able to, to, to sort of, oh yeah, there's a definite vocabulary here for what is, yeah. trying to be evoked so does that make sense to you do, that, do you do you feel a certain like is this is there something there that you think connects very much with what you felt yeah I, in terms of what in terms of what was trying to be created in that environment and and having you know there are a bunch of different environments that i've tried to you know whether it's a haunted house or it's a vampire house where mm -hmm. it's and you know, looking at the space ones, that I, I mean, the space ones never work because they end up being sort of kooky alien things. And so rather than that, yeah, the, the underwater cursed ocean liner or haunted house equivalents work and better than space. And I've never been able to quite put my finger on why. And I think your line of inquiry there is a really mm -hmm. interesting route as to why that might be. Uh, you know, so I've done lots of things like, why does this work and this doesn't like? Why do dolls and clowns work? I think it's the same. And and there, yeah. yeah, space doesn't work in live horror. Ships do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, that's, sorry, that's very interesting. No, go on, no, go on, go on. No, I was just interrupting to um kind of in in support in support because I do agree. I think that it's quite hard to do a good space horror and in live performance. I can't imagine the complexity. I think. Space comes with a lot of sort of imagery baggage. There's a lot of things that people feel they need to represent. And a lot of directors who've done sci-fi films have said, I'll never do it again because there was so much pressure on me creating something unique with an entire back catalogue of things that have come before. Um, but one of the things that just made me think while you were chatting there, Fred, was I think one of the really interesting things about oceanic horror is that it is an encounterable horror so far as space isn't I'm never going to go to space and unlike it's unlikely anybody here is but a lot of us have been in water have swum and depending on how good a swimmer you are have felt that terror when your feet don't hit the bottom and you panic so it's a bit more of an accessible fear than I think space is, which relies a lot more upon your imagination of the unknown, whereas the oceanic has something there that you can grab onto. Exactly. And I think to, sorry, sorry, sorry but I think to an extent also, everyone can, can fear and like the ocean in a very sort of like experiential day-to-day -day critiquing life of going there and you 
some some of us of course will not like swimming at all or we're loving and not be afraid at all but i think most of us will have this 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 pushing in this pushing in and tugging of fear and and fascination and liking for water sorry david no not at all i, I was merely about to make a sort of a uh, discussion about sort of it's interesting that it's almost as you could see a, a maybe a reverse trend from going that actually the underwater films have gone from sphere and abyss, strongly more conceptual films to something more formalistic like underwater. Uh, in the same time, space almost reversed. We've gone from alien to through to moon and then through to like Ad Astra, which is completely existential film. Oh, what a film though. I, I was yeah something about it it's really interesting you're right in regards to space horror because th th there's a really nice question in the chat that i would i will <laughs> calm myself on but um the space horror seems to have gone from slightly more formal um prep presentations that are probably most seen in anybody seen ghost of mars one of john carpenter's yep. yeah that is that is the most film film I've seen for a long time. Um, there's a lot of film in that film. Yeah, um, I don't, I don't hate it, but I think that says more about me than it does about the film. Yeah, I, I, I'm not a fan. I'll be honest, but I can see why it's really popular because it just has so many things in it. It relies so heavily on tropes, and one of the really good things about sci-fi as a genre. Uh, in the same way as horror is that if you're a, an even if you're an audience that is literate in that genre or if you're an audience that's coming to it blind you can both get kind of different things out of it you mm. can say oh I see alien in that or I see moon in that or things things like that um but yeah no I, I do think sci-fi now is tending towards more insular narratives like gravity is very isolated interstellar is a family drama <laughs> in space Ad Astra is one guy's dad problems extended to the stars. It's it's all very individual focused, and it's I wonder why potentially it's turned that way. We do we do as as you imply have a fantastic question here in the chat, which I think it's probably best if we put a pin in for the moment, but and, and come to at the very very end because I think it's a great question, and we'll we'll give partially an hour or so um, for the three of you to muse on this one, which is on the same topic. What do people think about the rise of the more earthy ocean ecological cosmic horror in more recent years, in contrast to the big space horror films of the noughts and tens? And thank you, Francis. And sorry, my shocking management of time has meant that it's probably best if we shunt this to the end and have a little break now. Uh, so if we say, I'll extend it a little bit further and say, Reese, if we begin Reese's talk at 20 past five uh, to give everybody 10 minutes to shuffle away and shuffle back again. Uh, once again, uh, I've loved this panel. Brilliant. Um, 